In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We find two remarkable things about today's Mass on this Sexagesima Sunday. First of all, we see that it has the longest Sunday epistle. And the second, far more remarkable, I think, is that in a departure from the usual practice on Sundays throughout the year, the collect of today's Mass, the prayer that sums up the thought of Holy Mother Church on this Sunday, makes a very specific reference to St. Paul, as we find the following words, O God, who seest that we put not our trust in any deed of our own, mercifully grant that by the protection of the teacher of the Gentiles, we may be defended against all adversities. Just how much does St. Paul merit this title of teacher of all the nations? It might well be said that every argument against Christianity, indeed the whole of anti-Christian thought and culture, is nothing more than 2,000 years of ignoring the existence of St. Paul. To be sure, the arguments against the Gospels are quite feeble, but they seem to afford many men with enough intellectual security to remain on the sidelines of the way of the cross. The man Christ Jesus portrayed in the Gospels is no doubt a compelling figure, the skeptics say, but who knows how accurate those accounts are. These are the exuberant words of, at best, well-meaning disciples seeking to extol their master and elevate him far beyond the persons of true history to vie with the great legends and myths of ancient times. Most men seek no further. That is because they have chosen to ignore St. Paul. In all history, St. Paul has never had a more eloquent admirer than the fourth century bishop and doctor, St. John Chrysostom. He tells us, as I listen intently to the reading of St. Paul's epistles, often two or three times a week, whenever we commemorate the holy martyrs, I am filled with joy, delighting in the sound of that spiritual trumpet. And as I recognize the voice of a friend, I am roused and enkindled with love, so that I almost seem to see him present and to hear him speaking. But nevertheless, I am grieved and am troubled that all do not know this great man as he deserves to be known. Indeed, many are so ignorant that they do not even know how many epistles he wrote. But this ignorance is not due to a want of intelligence on their part, but because they will not carefully study the writings of this great man. O oh, modern scoffer of our religion, do you refuse to listen to the friends of Christ? Well, then grant an audience, at least, to this dear friend of ours, who was once Christ's enemy. In his epistle to the Philippians, Paul affords us the briefest, yet most moving, of autobiographies. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse in order that I may gain Christ. 
The fathers of the church were all in accord in finding in this Saul of Tarsus fulfillment of the prophecy spoken of old by Jacob. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, in the morning devouring the prey, but in the evening dividing the spoil. This son of the tribe of Benjamin, named for Israel's tragic first king, was a ravenous wolf indeed. In the morning of his life, he pursued Christ with boundless ferocity in order to destroy his very name from the earth. Having found him, he counted this spoil as greater than any treasure the world could ever hope to offer. And he then spent the evening of his earthly existence sharing that divine spoil with all the nations he could reach by his travels and toils. The first Saul fought against David and perished by the sad sword of suicide atop Mount Gilboa, outside of the future royal capital of Jerusalem. The second Saul, now Romanized as Paul, so that he might be all things to all men and gain all men for Christ, the son of David, he poured out every ounce of his life for the sake of the gospel until he suffered martyrdom by the sword outside the walls of the future capital of the kingdom of the new and eternal testament. Why do we praise St. Paul today? Today is no great feast of the apostles though this Sunday might occasionally coincide with one. We are in the midst of Shrovetide, the three weeks of examination of conscience that prepare us for Lent. On each of these three Sundays, as on so many throughout the year, we read from the epistles of St. Paul. But on this Sunday, the Church seems unable to contain the sentiments of love she bears toward her great teacher, and so she invites us to invoke him especially as our patron for the approaching season of penance. On the three Sundays of Shrovetide and on the first Sunday of Lent, the Church places us among those first believers of the Church founded by St. Paul in the pagan Greek city of Corinth. Last Sunday, he warned us that those who yawningly shuffle to the sacraments week after week, or by no means assured of their salvation. Next week, he will teach us that all our plans for penance, good works, and additional prayers will be for naught if they are prompted by self-interest and not inflamed by the greatest of all virtues, the perfect love of charity. On the first Sunday of Lent, he will announce to us that the time for our conversion is short, and it is now. But I dare say it is, above all, today's passage from 2 Corinthians that should move us to tears. For I cannot doubt that its human author, divinely inspired though he was, had very human tears when he wrote it. In his first epistle to the church at Corinth, which we heard last Sunday, Paul rebukes his flock for having so quickly abandoned the truth which he had preached to them and returned to the most shameful practices of the pagan world around them and broken into factions. Some responded well to this stern correction, but many others decided that they would be better off with new teachers who afforded them an easier path. After all, the seductive narrative ran, who was this Paul anyway? How could he of all people dare to rebuke us for our sins? 
He is the greatest sinner of all, a persecutor of Christ's church. This Paul could not deny. Indeed, he was always the first to tell them of it. He frankly admitted to his flock, I have no letter of recommendation except you yourselves. Yes, you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. I am your father, he said again and again, for I begot you all in the gospel. It hurts for a father to be betrayed by his children. But in the end, I don't care if you hate me for rebuking you, as long as you learn to hate sin and turn back to God. It is for this reason that Paul, in the passage we read today, takes so much time to remind the Corinthians of all of his sufferings for the gospel, his shipwrecks, his stonings, his beatings, all the times he had to flee for his life, all the times he was persecuted for preaching the gospel. And even the time when he was taken, their in or out of body, up into heavenly paradise, to hear words which it is not allowed for any man to repeat. Yes, even this, for he tells them straight away afterwards, so that I would not be puffed up by the greatness of this revelation, I was allowed to suffer the torments of an angel of Satan who buffeted me. We do not know for certain whether St. Paul speaks here of terrible temptations, as St. Thomas Aquinas would have it, Or with most of the fathers, he simply refers here to the fact that he endured endless persecutions and, above all, betrayals from his own flock. Whatever the case, we know that he cried out in all his weakness for him to be delivered, begging God to take away these sufferings, to which our Lord responded, My grace is sufficient for thee. I am made great in thy infirmity. Why then recount all these things to his flock if not to tell them, No, I do not tell you these things so that I may earn praise from men. Rather, I tell you of all these things, including of my past sins of persecuting the church of God, in order to make clear to you there is no explanation for me, no explanation for a Saul of Tarsus, become a Paul, apostle to the Gentiles, if not the grace of Christ. As we prepare ourselves for the great spiritual warfare of Lent, we shall find no better patron than that one the Church proposes to us today, the teacher who brings us all truth, the Father who loves us, rebukes us, and teaches us the way of tears that lead to true repentance. O God, who seest that we put not our trust in any deed of our own, mercifully grant that by the protection of the teacher of the Gentiles we may be defended against all adversities through Christ our Lord. Amen.